So we've been developing uh, our second principle codes uh, much in parallel with uh, multi-binit. Uh, so so let's let's see what what I can tell you about uh, what we've been doing. So uh, the group that is the core group for developing uh, uh, scale up is Javier, who will be giving the, the second part of this talk. And Jorge, who is in, in list uh, at, at presently. Okay, so you all know very well what we can do with, with first principles. And the, the main thing, and, and one of the main things that, that it's good with first principles is that we know that with very little input, we can reliably predict uh, properties. Uh, so most of, so, we either solve in uh, the solving equation, if you are a quantum chemist, you will be doing that a lot, or doing DFT, and we can get geometries. Uh, we can get so uh, an accurate energies, but when we move away from energies and geometries, we start having problems. So if we want to do excited states, if we want to do temperature or defects, that's difficult. And uh, one of the main problems that we have is uh, what happens when we want to calculate uh, larger systems, okay? But uh, we all use these techniques because there is a lot of information that we can get that is very difficult to obtain experimentally or in order to uh, interpret what, what experiments can do. So what's the problem? So when we go to uh, length scales, so nowadays many of the interesting objects are in the scale of 10 to, the, uh, to 100 nanometers. May it be some kind of nanotech. Or when we are dealing with structures like skirmions, where we can see here that they are about 30 nanometers. So calculating this in DFTs is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, also, when we go to non-equilibrium states, so today we had a lot of about resistivity, but resistivity is also about uh, disorder, and disorder is very difficult to capture in DFT because we don't, we cannot go to to, to large uh, supercells. So, if we want to uh, simulate domains, if we want to have thermal information about how these these domains move, or if we want to go to calculate defects and the, uh, and, and the effect of these defects on the properties, then DFT is restricted to, to uh, is, is, is not letting us move forward. Okay, so uh, along this line, uh, the way this, it's very important also to see how these domains or how this disorder changes when we apply temperature or when we uh, apply an electric field or when we make perturbations that are always key uh, elements in all these, these, these experiments. So the question here is what can we do? So our uh, approach is, okay, we want to keep the ability to predict. So we want to keep the, the first principles uh, as uh, the, the, the one of the main qualities of first principles, but we want to go to larger systems. So the idea is that when we consider all the electrons in the systems, so we know that we have the problems with the Hamiltonian, just, just creating the Hamiltonian or diagonalizing the Hamiltonian. But most of the uh, experimentalists or, or many of the experiments involve making a small perturbations that usually only involve a few active electrons of holes. And we are going to base our second principles in, in, in over that. So the idea is we want to create models that can reproduce essentially what DFT can do, and we can start removing detail and go to the model Hamiltonians that are already uh, used uh, nowadays. But the idea is to do it 
reliably, in a smooth way, and in a way that it is predictive using all the time uh, first principles uh, in order to create these, these models. And we call this uh, second principles density functional method. Okay, so how do we do this? So the idea is that we want to uh, separate the active electrons from the bulk of the electrons. Uh, so the idea is imagine that we have an insulator that we dope with some electrons or with holes. So the idea is that we'll get the geometry for the neutral system and then we want to describe where those electrons or those holes go. And in order to do so, what we are going to do is we are going to separate the full density for our system, so the full self-consistent density, into a reference and a different density or deformation density that is going to be associated with the defects. Okay, so now the idea is we want to plug this into the full DFT uh, energy. And that is more or less easy to do, except for the exchange correlation. So in order to uh, move forward from, from the exchange correlation, so what we do is we expand the exchange correlation in the deformation density. And this is typical of tie binding DFT methods that did this uh, before uh, that than we do, did. And uh, the idea is that we are going to take this expansion to second order. The idea is that at the end, at second order, we are going to have a formalism that looks like hartree fox So it should be uh, OK to, to uh, do most of the things we want to do. But we are going to group terms in a different way to uh, tie bind DFT in order to get more accuracy. So what's the idea? So the idea is that the, uh, when, when you go to simulate a the material, there are different approaches. So when you go for first principles or tie binding DFT, the core element, what you use in a simulation, is you need to have pseudopotentials, for example, or an anatomic basis. So your, your element for the construction of your system is an atom. So first principles are very good because they can give you bonding. Uh, so when you make this expansion, what you have is that your reference system is essentially giving you what, hap what is going on with your atomic cores, but your correction is, uh, involves uh, bonding. And in the bonding, most of the electrons are involved. So this is not what we want to do. So the idea is for us, our starting point is, okay, we go for, uh, first principle code, we mix the atoms and we get a material and our construction piece is going to be this material. So what we want to do, we are going to start from the description of first principle of a material and then what we are going to have, so for us, this reference is going to be, let's say, the ground state of an insulator and then we are going to start looking at ways into which we can describe these electron excitations or electron perturbations. And with this, we can go, we can take these materials from first principle and go to large scale. What's the catch? The catch is that we cannot uh, do bond breaking. So the idea is we don't want to perturb the density so much that we uh, break the, 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 the bonds. With this, we can still do many of the problems that we are interested in in uh, solid state physics. Maybe you cannot do surface uh, chemistry, but still many of, of the simulations at the large scale can, can be done with this kind of, of approach, okay? And in order to express all these, these uh, electron excitations, what we uh, do is we use uh, Bannier functions in order to create our model. So what's, what are the different terms? How, how, are these, how do these, these terms look like? So the, the E0 is just the DFT energy for the reference system. So the idea is that uh, this contains most of the electrons and what we are going to do is we are going to uh, substitute this term by a force field. So, in fact, the, all the calculations that involve all the electrons are associated to a force field and are really, really fast. 
Okay, so this is uh, what is implemented in multivinit at the moment, which is a force field that you can use in order to simulate uh, phase transitions and so on, but always with an electronic state that is uh, fixed, that is the, the one captured by your uh, force field. And, of course, this depends on the uh, geometry of your system. Uh, what's the E1? So when you go and you do all the, 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 when you make the substitution, E1 looks like this, and when you express it with a Bernier uh, basis, what you end up is with this expression where this is the different density matrix, and gamma AB is essentially a tie binding uh, model. So this is something that can be immediately extracted from first principles. Okay, and what is the second part? So, so the, the E2 uh, involves this kind of integral where G is an electron-electron interaction operator that is a screen, so it involves the uh, exchange and correlation uh, functional and when we express it in our Bernier basis, so it comes out uh, in this way where we have some Hubbard-like uh, uh, term, uh, constants and some Stoner-like constant that are going to give us the magnetic polarization in our, in our system. So with all uh, this, what we end up is with a Hamiltonian that is going to be accurate, that we can reproduce uh, both the lattice and electronic properties that is going to be uh, fast and that is going to be valid for all kinds of, of systems, okay? So that is not all the ingredients. We also include electrostatics. So for us, we are going, since our orbitals are localized, we can essentially uh, create a, a far re a long range uh, potential associated to charges and dipoles associated to the position of the Bernier orbitals and then we find that gamma contains a long range contribution and U also includes a long range contribution and uh, we in, in order to obtain all these local dipoles and local charges what we need is we need to, to find the uh, Born charges associated to the movement of our atoms and in order to find the dipoles created by the uh, orbital hybridizations, we need these uh, matrix elements that are also produced by Bernier 90. Okay, so with this we can create a, a potential of point charges and dipoles that are interacting. Okay, so that means that our model parameters are going to include both long and short range contributions. And finally, we need to include what happens when we move the atoms because that changes the electronic structure. So our uh, tie binding elements, then we make them dependent with some electron lattice coupling terms up to uh, second order which is going to give us uh, all the electron phonon coupling or electron lattice effects, including uh, Jan Teller and, and, and things like this. Okay, so then we can correct the forces associated with our force field with something that comes from the uh, uh, electron part. Okay, so some examples. So the idea is that uh, for example, we, we, we can calculate electronic states. So we need to first to create the models. The models are created using Bernier 90, reproducing uh, the bands. I will go there in a, in a moment. So the, the moment we fit the bands, we can uh, then calculate the uh, coupling constants that are associated with total energies. And the moment we do that, we see that the uh, kind of coupling constant that we obtain in second principles are really similar to the LDA plus U uh, first principle calculations that we use in order to create the model. So in fact, we, we are, uh, since we are not uh, fitting this, we are predictive. Uh, and of course, we can, we can make calculations that 
quite, quite quickly. So I tried to do this with BASP, uh, and it took around a week. Uh, but, but in an hour, we, we had the, the results. And we also can have complex interactions between uh, electron and lattice. For example, here we are trying to simulate the uh, bidimensional electron gas at the interface between strontium titanate and lanthanum uh, aluminate. Uh, so the idea is that the charge that is here is going to be screened by the uh, ferroelectric distortions uh, associated with the strontium titanate uh, uh, cell. And here we are comparing the first principle simulations of Max Stengel, both for the uh, electron density. So there is a red line that is the uh, first principle, and the blue line is the second principle, and the rampling that is associated with the uh, geometry. So you can see that the, the red lines are first principle, blue lines uh, second principle. So again, we have... Uh, the ability to predict uh, or, or to calculate large systems in a, a, a fast fashion. And another example, perhaps uh, with a larger number of atoms. So here we are making a simulation in a system with 40,000 atoms. This is PTO-STO. And the idea is that we have these bubbles that are created. These are domains, bubble domains in, in, in lead titanate. And we can predict the shape of these bubbles. And we can see how the polarization uh, twists around the, uh, the core. And not only that, but we also observe a tangential uh, polarization here. That was uh, our prediction. That uh, we, we did, and our experimental colleagues were able to, to uh, corroborate this kind of, of prediction, and it shows the kind of, of power that the uh, second principle have with, uh, when, when you try to tackle very large simulations that are clearly beyond what we can do in, in, in first principles. Okay, so, but, so, all this is implemented in our code that is called a scale up. So the idea is that in a scale up, we have a fully integrated electron and lattice models. We can do a single point. We can do uh, some uh, molecular dynamics. We have SCF and we have a time dependent DFT uh, in a real density, a real time uh, uh, implementation that allows us to do optics and transport. Uh, this is a Fortran 90 code that is uh, parallelized. And uh, we have uh, a Python module with much less functionality than AviPy, but still uh, growing up. And very importantly for us, and perhaps the most delicate element in all this, is the model building suit that is called Model Maker that we'll, we'll discuss in, in a moment. And what we expect in the future is to be able to improve the, the kind of systems that we can tackle to go to larger systems, essentially with a pure real space uh, SCF implementation working on, on just a density matrix. So what's, what's the, uh, uh, so this code can interact with, with others, in particular with multibinit. And the way uh, this is, so the idea is that multibinit can calculate the lattice, energy, and force, and then it can call a scale up in order to give the uh, corrections associated with the uh, electrons in order to find the, the uh, results. So, in fact, a scale up can be called as a library to provide the lattice the electron part of the whole thing of, or, or the, the whole energy. And just using three main calls, just an initialization step, and then it can call, calculate energy or calculate forces. You provide it with the, the geometry, and it is going to give you the correction that you need, and that is what multivinit is, is doing right now. Okay, so 
one, one thing is that a scale up at the moment is not uh, d distributed freely. What we ask is that you come to speak with us uh, to the workshop. Why? Essentially, we are doing this for two reasons. In order to uh, create a community that is, knows each other well, and second, because of what I was saying at the beginning. So when you go to a first principle simulation, you can train a student to very quickly get reliable information. At the present moment, second principles are not like that. You need to know exactly what you are doing, and the models are extremely tricky. So what we want is that in the future, uh, creating second principle models is simple, as simple as nowadays getting a pseudo-potential. But at the moment, we are at a step where creating models is a really uh, tough job. So, and this is uh, where interactions with first principle codes are important. So right now, in order to get a second principle, in order in getting to, to run second principle, you need material models, and the only way to do that is doing first principles. So what we need is, okay, you need models that are accurate and that are lightweight so that uh, the second principle run is really uh, efficient. But in order to do this, we also need, and this is very important, something that is robust and that is completely automated. So it's really first principle. You don't have many uh, knobs in order to tweak your calculation in order to, to obtain the results that you want, but the, the results that you should, uh, that, that come from, from something that is first principle, so it's predictive. So you need to create the models using few and very clean input parameters, and these parameters should also allow you to create systematically improvable models. And finally, these models should provide for hopping electron lattice and electron-electron parameters. And what we currently have is an interface between a scale-up with Siesta and Siesta with Vanier 90 in order to create all this. So the idea is that when you start doing a run with Model Maker, you, what you want to end up is with uh, this Vanier uh, Hamiltonian the electron lattice and the electron-electron uh, terms. And in order to do that, is you, what you need to provide is an input example for your system, and model maker is going to create a supercell in order to, to calculate the tie binding elements and the position elements using uh, Panier 90. It's going to uh, start changing the geometries in order to perturb the electron lattice and, and uh, uh, terms and obtain this part of the Hamiltonian. And finally, it's going to uh, perform control perturbations of the electronic system in order to calculate this. So at the end, all everything should go through Vanier 90. So right now we are calling Siesta, but Okay, why wouldn't we be able to call uh, uh, Vanier uh, uh, Avinit in order to do all this? So now, in order to explain you how this interface uh, works, uh, Javier will jump in. Thank you, Javier, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I will follow up uh, Pablo's talk, and I will explain uh, briefly the interface between Siesta and Vanier 90 that will produce the parameters required for our second principle calculations done with, uh, with a scale up. So, uh, as Pablo has said, the method is coined second principles because we need some parameters provided by first principles. And as a summary of, um, of his talk, we have here the expression for the energy. Here we have the energy of the reference atomic geometry, and here, as you see, we have one electron parameter and two electron parameters here required to deal with the strong correlation and magnetism in our systems. And moreover, some of these parameters are, depend also on the um, electronic structure. So, for instance, in this short range one electron parameter, we include also how the parameters change depending on the uh, geometry of the system, of the position, relative positions of the atoms. Okay? So 
now I will explain how we are getting those parameters uh, that are expressed in a basis set of Vanier functions. So the formal equations for these uh, one electron parameters like this. So here we have a sandwich between two Vanier functions and in the middle we have the consum Hamiltonian for the reference uh, geometry here, for the reference um, atomic geometry and the reference density. And here we have the uh, formal expression for the two electron parameters. We have here the integral of four Vanier functions and here the J's where the J's are the screened uh, electron-electron uh, interactions. So we have chosen Vanier functions as the basis set for our second principle uh, simulations. And here we have a summary of the schema that uh, Pablo has uh, explain about how we are getting the uh, parameters. So we rely on a code, model maker, that is here model maker we'll call uh, Siesta for many training sets, many atomic uh, configurations. We will compute for those uh, training sets the, we will arrive to self-consistency, compute uh, the, the charge density and all the input required by Vanier 90. So from Siesta we will call Vanier 90 and Vanier 90 will give us some of the uh, parameters that we uh, require. And this will be called for all the different uh, 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 geometries that we will have in our training set and we will extract also the electron lattice couplings and the uh, electron-electron uh, interactions. So there is no particular reason why what I will explain from now on we can uh, change siesta and put abinit on, on top of that. So there is no particular thing why we are just attached to siesta beyond my natural uh, environment. So I've been working with siesta for 20 and something years now and it's my obvious uh, ecosystem. So what we have done is the following. So we need an interaction between siesta and Vanier 90 and it's much more useful if we can call Vanier 90 directly from Siesta. So why? Well, because first of all, we don't need to prepare two different input files and to take into account, okay, I have to change this in the input file of Siesta and the key be consistent in the input file of Vanier uh, 90, sorry. So we open the door for just making some, some mistakes. So in this way, calling Vanier 90 directly from Siesta, so we have only one input file we don't need to run Vanier 90 in preprocessing mode to generate the NAKP uh, file and then run Siesta and then run Vanier 90 again. So just one call and that's enough. So we can use the numerical atomic orbitals of Siesta as the initial guesses for the projections, as the localized uh, functions to, to start the uh, uh, minimization of the Vanier functions. We can Vanierize the different manifolds in one shot. So we don't need to uh, run Vanier 90 many, many times uh, one after the other. So one shot and is enough. And moreover, we will have access to the unitary matrices that made the connection between the block functions and the uh, Vanier functions. So we can go uh, and, and back between Siesta and Vanier 90 and this is also very, very useful. Moreover, it allows us to interface not only with a scale up, but with other codes. For instance, this uh, density, uh, sorry, dynamical mean field theory code implemented by Aldo Romero's group. So it's, uh, it will be also quite straightforward to, to merge uh, this uh, code with, with Siesta. So we have to tweak a little bit Vanier 90. So the changes are extremely localized, very well localized and are minor in the sense that we have to trick Vanier 90 to tell uh, the code, don't use the input file of Vanier 90, I will give you the input directly from Siesta. So there are some comments, and uh, because we are going to Vanierize many manifolds uh, one after the other from the, in, in just one single call to Siesta, we need to deallocate and uh, reallocate again some um, uh, matrices to avoid uh, the crashing. But as you see, the changes are really, really minor and very well uh, localized. So what we have done is the following. Uh, you have to download 
Banyan 90 code directly from uh, the official web page. And then you need to apply a patch here that has been implemented by um, uh, Jean Pujon. And then after apply the, the, the patch, you compile Banyan 90 in library mode. And then you link Banyan 90 in, uh, with Siesta. It's very, very easy. And even more, Banyan 90 is already in the, um, in the Siesta uh, bundle. So for the user, it's uh, extremely easy to do this uh, combination of Banyan 90 and, 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 and Siesta. So let me put here an example. So a practical example is bulk strong in titanate in the cubic phase. And here you have the band structure of uh, strong in titanate obtained with, uh, with Siesta. One important thing I would like to stress here. Uh, during the last few years, we have made an effort in order to make the transition or to facilitate the transition and the exchange of uh, data between Siesta and Abinit. In particular, this calculation here has been done with the pseudo-potentials implemented by Don Hammonds in, uh, in his code, and the, those pseudo-potentials are available in the pseudo-dojo project. And then you can run Siesta and Abinit exactly with the same pseudo-potential. Same local part, same projectors, the same file. Okay, the file is written in this PSML uh, format. And then we are using exactly the same exchange and correlation functional, because we are using the libxc uh, library. So at the level of the functionals, exactly the same thing. So in principle, the cross-talking between Siesta and Abinit should be quite, or a little bit more easier than, than, than before. So that, in a, uh, a parenthesis, let's uh, resume the work here. So here I have the band structure for estrogen titanate, and here I have the projected density of states. So as we can see, we have very localized bands here. This one with a strongly titanium 3S character, and then, okay, we can extract the character of the different bands from the uh, uh, density of a state. So let's take a zoom here to the top of the balance band and the bottom of the conduction band, and we have something like this. So we have here different uh, isolated manifolds, and uh, here the top of the balance band that is here is mostly oxygen 2P in character, and the bottom of the conduction band that is here is mostly titanium T2G in character. That's well known. So the thing that we are going to do is to banerize three different manifolds. The first manifold is the top of the balance band. So it's mostly oxygen 2P in character. So we have uh, three oxygens and three P's or P orbitals for oxygen. So we have here nine bands. The second manifold is this one here, where we have three titanium T2G orbitals. So this manifold is made of three bands. And the third manifold is the combination of the two. So we combine the top of the balance band and the bottom of the conduction band, and we will banerize the two of them all together. So this is required <coughs> because some, <coughs> sorry, some of the input required by uh, a scale up is the position operator between a banner here in this manifold and another banner here in this manifold. So in order to get this position operator this, uh, between different manifolds, there is, we have to banerize the two of them uh, together. So let's show here the input file in uh, Siesta. So we, here we have number of bands or number of band manifolds for banier, in this case three, and we have three blocks that are essentially repeated. So let's go uh, to the first one, for instance, step by step. So this is for the first manifold. So the indices of the bands run from the band number 12 to the band number 20. So you count the bands essentially here. And then you see that those bands are essentially the bands that correspond to the oxygen uh, 2P. Here you have the number of bands on the manifold. And here you have the number of banniers. So the number of banniers may be the same as the number of bands or may be smaller. If you, if, there are some, uh, if you require some disentanglement. So if there is a band crossing a given manifold, and then you want to disentangle some of them, this, the number of banniers here may be different from the number of uh, bands uh, in, the, in, the, in the manifold. Here we have the initial guesses. So we have here nine uh, banniers. So the banniers are oxygen P in character. So here you have a list of the orbitals in, in Siesta, and then you localize which 
which one corresponds to the uh, p orbitals. This is going to change in the future. So this is the first version. This is, the, this is not so user friendly. In the future, we will, the user will have to specify oxygen p, and that's all. And the system will immediately localize which atomic orbitals should be used for the, the initial gases. So here, the number of iterations in the, um, for banierization, and we set up this number to zero. We are going to sacrifice the maximally localization. Why? Because we are mostly interested in maximally projection. I mean, in, to keep the symmetry of the banniers. Because just to keep track of a given banier, when we displace the atoms, and to compute the electron lattice couplings. So if you displace the atoms, in many cases, the banniers change the shape in an abrupt way because they want to maximally localize, to be maximally localized. In this particular case, we, want to like, we would like to keep the symmetry to keep track of, okay, this banner is here. When we move the atom, this is moving in that way or that other way. So that is why here we sacrifice the localization, writing here number of iterations zero, and, uh, uh, but we uh, maximize, let's say, the projection of a given atomic uh, orbital. So here are some instructions to plot the, the Vanier functions or to plot the Fermi surface. And here two keywords, in particular this one, this one here is important, to write the, um, um, the lattice vectors and the Hamiltonian in real space and position operator in the basis of Vanier functions. So this has been implemented by Pablo within Vanier 90. And here in this file, we have all the parameters of the tight binding uh, Hamiltonian written in the basis of uh, Vanier's. So what is the output of siesta? In siesta, we perform a run, and then at some point, we start to compute the required matrices for Vanier 90, and at some point, we are giving the control to Vanier 90. And we, are, uh, we explicitly tell here in the output that from this point on, it's uh, Vanier 90, the code that is computing the things. It's not siesta any, any, any longer. So here we have the header of Vanier 90 with all the credits, the paper that uh, must be cited, and so on and so forth. And the output is exactly the same as the output of Vanier 90. And in this particular case here, we see the centers of the uh, banniers, and here the uh, spreading for these uh, manifolds, for instance. And the same here, so it's, the output is, from a given point on, the output is exactly the same as in Vanier 90. So just uh, in the last... Uh, so we can plot again the, the banniers uh, very, very easily. So here, for instance, we have this banner with a, a marked uh, P character, as uh, it should be in, in this example. So just in the last uh, minute. So in this way, we can compute the one um, uh, electron parameter and uh, how this one electron parameter changes with the position of the atoms. So what about the two electron parameters? For that, we need to change the... Uh, electronic configuration in a controlled way. And what we have done is the following. We can write banniers in the basis of our numerical atomic orbital. So, so this is the expression of a banner. For simplicity, I am assuming just one, uh, one man. And here I have the expression of my uh, block function in terms of my uh, uh, numerical atomic orbital. So combining both expressions, I can write my banniers in terms of my atomic orbitals. Once I have this, what I can do is to arrive to self-consistence in, in siesta, compute the banner functions and freeze them, then express the banner functions in a basis of numerical atomic orbitals, as, as, uh, as I've explained uh, here. And then what I can say is, okay, let's put a penalty for some banners. So let's increase or decrease the energy of uh, a given... Uh, 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 or a given charge density related with, with a banner like here. Okay, so I can compute the um, uh, Hamiltonian in real space between a given atomic orbital mu and nu in this way here. So the projection of this atomic orbital with the banner, of this atomic orbital with the banner, and in the middle, this chemical potential to shift uh, the energy. And then introduce this and perform self-consistency again. And in this way, we can modify the occupation associated with a given banner. And for instance, if we uh, do this for the case of titanium, strontium titanate, and I modify, just, just to put here an example, I can uh, modify the position of the titanium 3S here. 
So I increase this by three electron volts, and I can see how I can move this band up by three electron volts. I can control the occupancy of that particular vanier, and with this, I can compute the two uh, electron uh, terms. So essentially, that's all. This is very, very automatic. This can be merged with Model Maker, and Model Maker can launch many calculations in a high throughput way. And at the end of the day, the user, with a minimum input for, from the user, you will get all the parameters required by uh, ScaleUp. So thank you very much.